en Jalisco, en México y qué son las cosas que podemos hacer para, para cambiar el ecosistema. Uh, voy a hablar un poco de, de mi historia y después voy a hablar un poco de mi percepción de lo que hemos visto aquí en el Silicon Valley. Como mis padres son aquí muy cercas, ellos son mexicanos, yo nací en California, entonces mi español está más o menos, mi Spanglish está mejor que mi español y mi inglés está mucho mejor que mi Spanglish. Entonces la exposición va a ser en, en inglés. So we're going through the fourth industrial revolution. Obviously the first one was the steam engine. The steam engine allowed you to mechanize and make a lot of manual processes a little more automated. This allowed factories to grow, companies to grow and actually be able to invest in scale and new products. The second industrial revolution was ele actually electrifying a lot of these factories. So these processes that used to require huge machines could actually get much, much smaller. And so with smaller machines, smaller factories, you were actually able to automate a lot more. This continued with electronics. So you went from the transistor to the integrated circuit, which allowed you to send rockets to the moon, to put men on the moon, allowed you to have more automated cars. It allowed you to take a lot of the automated processes and put them into really small devices. So the fourth industrial revolution is the evolution of this. For the last 30 or 40 years, a lot of, a lot of investment has actually gone into the development of new technologies in different areas. So if we look at what we're going to see over the next 20 or 30 years, the next 20 or 30 years are going to be more exciting than anything that we've seen in the last 100 years. And so we're going to see everything from banking to healthcare to education completely change. You know, one of the things that was really interesting about the last talk is that they're talking about how Ford is actually bringing a lot more product jobs into Mexico, and that is incredibly important. Because for the last 20 or 30 years, Mexico has, has benefited from cheap labor, but if we actually think about the evolution and the next industrial revolution, a lot of what's currently being done by manual labor is going to be completely mechanized. And so you're going to have machines and robots that are going to be doing a lot of what humans have been doing. Obviously hammering a nail and a piece of wood is the obvious one. But even what we think about as software and just building simple apps, eventually a lot, of, a lot of automation, a lot of artificial intelligence is going to go into this. And so the fact that Ford is investing in true R&D, in creating true intellectual properties, incredibly impressive and incredibly important. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, my parents are from a small town um, just outside of Guadalajara. Uh, it's called Huchitlan. I think at its peak, it probably had about 4,000 people. And currently, it gravitates between 500 and 1,000 people. Um, my mom has a college degree from the UDG, but my dad has a sixth grade education. When my dad was 12, his father died. And at my grandfather's burial, he saw that his his mother was, was crying and just didn't know what would, come, what would become of, of her family. So my dad, being the eldest, he looked around and he said, Mom, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. So at 13, uh, he moved to the States and became a migrant field worker, as is the case for a lot of the immigrants that move to the U.S. in search for a better life. Obviously with the internet, things have changed and there's a flow of information, but back then it was understood that opportunity was in the US, that the, that the roads were paved in gold. The reality is a little bit different. So when my dad arrived in the US, he basically lived in big work camps. So at the age of 13, he was living with 14 other grown men who were all working in the fields. He actually has a really funny story that at the end of every day, uh, they would all file into this big room to shower together. It's kind of weird. But 
he, uh, he didn't appreciate bumping up against other grown men. And so what he would do is he'd find a shower head and he turned on the cold water and immediately everybody would disperse to the walls. Uh, he continued doing this for the next 15 years and he put four of his siblings through engineering school and put two of his siblings through medical school. And then 15 years later, uh, he marries my mother and they move to the States. This is my dad. Even though my mother had a college education because she didn't speak English, she also worked in the field. And then when I turned five, they settled down in Southern California and my parents said, look, we don't know how you're going to do it, um, but you need to go to college. You need to get a college education. And um, I'm like, okay. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll get a college education. So I was very lucky and ended up um, attending Stanford, getting into Stanford. Uh, when I got to Stanford, I was going to be a, a medical doctor because the most successful person I knew at that time was a doctor. But this was 1998, and in 1998, the dot-coms, the internet was just taking off. And for me, Stanford wasn't just an introduction to academics and the world and understanding what else there was out there. It was actually an introduction to the Silicon Valley. So the Silicon Valley is right smack in the center of Stanford. And I know one would say that Stanford's right smack in the center of the Silicon Valley. But out of Stanford, the Silicon Valley emerged. And even though I studied economics and computer science, really I studied uh, startups. I used to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, go to the office, work until about 9 a.m. Uh, at 9 a.m. I'd go back to class, attend class until 2 p.m. 2 p.m. I'd go back to the office, work until about 8 because it's a technology company in the Silicon Valley. They would feed me. So I'm like, I don't have to pay for dinner, so I'll just stay at the office a little bit longer. Go back to class and then study. Um, I was able to pay for college working at these startups. I learned a tremendous amount, and I was able to parlay what I learned at startups and at Stanford uh, to eventually end up at Google. So when I joined Google, there were roughly about 200 employees. Uh, when I left Google, there were roughly about 15,000 employees. Uh, this was an incredible time. So I joined at the end of 2002. Google, today it's very easy to look at Google as a company that's building autonomous cars, that's doing machine learning, that's building artificial intelligence and doing amazing things. At the time, Google had, one, had two products. They had the search engine and they had an advertising product that was starting to do really well. After a little while, um, Google grew and they, they bought this little company called YouTube. And at the time, my, my team was responsible for monetizing uh, video. And we, I was managing click to play video ads. And I remember we were having meetings with media companies, the same media companies that publicly were saying, we're going to sue Google because Google and YouTube are the center of piracy. These same companies wanted to learn how they could use YouTube as a distribution platform and what they can, could learn from Google to actually build out their own sites. I know a lot of you are incredibly young, but back in 2006, 2007, Netflix was still sending DVDs everywhere. Uh, iTunes wasn't streaming video or movies at the time. Uh, I think one of the most innovative companies in terms of streaming was actually Televisa. And so I decided to leave uh, Google and start a company. Uh, so I started uh, Uyala. There's the Uyala crew right there. Uh, I started Uyala with my younger brother who was at, um, at Stanford and also working at Google and a good friend from college. All three of us were at Google and we decided to leave and start this little video platform company called Uyala. We raised a lot of money, we grew the team, we actually built a team here in Guadalajara that has been incredibly strategic for the overall growth of the business. Uh, and eventually we sold it to Telstra for over $400 million. 
And uh, that was pretty cool. But it's a story that's told over and over and over again in Silicon Valley. Instagram had 10 people when it was sold for a billion dollars to Facebook. WhatsApp had 50 people, right? The, the people who founded WhatsApp couldn't get a job anywhere. They, 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 were let, they weren't hired by Facebook, and so they're like, well, what am I gonna do? I'm just gonna go start my own company. And so this happens over and over and over again. So why does this matter and why is this important? Mexico is an amazing place, right? We, if you think about the distribution of talent, there should be as many talented people in Mexico as anywhere else in the world. And given the population, there should be a huge concentration of talent. But if you think about how we're perceived as Mexicans on the world stage, we're considered low-cost labor, uh, we're considered people who primarily focus on soccer and, and aren't necessarily striving to do great things. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was flying back from Mexico City and I was watching the movie Concussion. Uh, it's the Will Smith movie where they talked about how football is really horrible for you, American football is really horrible for you uh, because your brain basically turns to mush. And in that movie, I'm kind of working on the plane and, and, and listening to the movie, and I hear Guadalajara, so I rewind. And here you have Will Smith is a doctor who was a pathologist at the time. Uh, well, not Will Smith, but the character. And he happened to, to run the autopsy for a football player. And he kind of cut into the brain, and he, he was amazed at what he saw. He, this guy, who was incredibly young, was experiencing symptoms of someone who was 70, 80 years older. And so he basically goes after the NFL uh, because he believes that football is a very dangerous sport. So in this, he, he goes and he talks to the coach of the, uh, the, the team doctor of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he says, Bennett, I did my own research on the NFL's brain injury committee. You know what Dr. Elliot Pellman is? He's a rheumatologist. He, he's a specialist in arthritis and joint pain. He's, uh, he's asking, like, what does the guy that works on arthritis know anything about the brain? But then this is the thing that ticked me off. And corporate men like this, corporate men like this in this country come from Harvard, Yale. But Pellman went to medical school in Guadalajara. He went to the Autonoma. And Bells, the, the team doctor, comes back and says, Mexico? I didn't know that. That's beautiful. He wasn't saying that's beautiful. He, he found it incredibly funny. And I think that that's how we're perceived, and we need to change that. Everyone here is about to, most of you are incredibly young, and you're about to experience a tremendous amount of growth in Mexico's future. Things in Mexico have actually never been better for you to actually affect change. And what we do here, what we do in the next five years is actually going to dictate what Mexico is going to look like in the next 20 years. So I want to talk about a couple of things that I think we need to do as a group to be better, to be able to compete on the global stage. So the first one's cultural. I think as a group, we don't value education enough. We don't, we don't value math and sciences as, as much as we should. You know, we value the church, we value soccer, we value the family. If we can get education to be at the same level, Mexico will improve by leaps and bounds. You know, when I got to Stanford, um, I never visited Stanford, right? I got my acceptance letter and I kind of went and it was an amazing place, but when I got there, I called my younger brother, who was seven years younger, who was the co-founder of Uyala, and I told him two things. I told him, there are these things called boarding schools. It's these things that rich kids go to, and you live there, and you study there, and you eat there. It's kind of like mini college, but the kids who graduate from boarding schools are incredibly well prepared. They're the ones that come in, and they're the ones that get the A's, 
They're the ones that destroy the curve. The second thing I told them was, the, this internet thing, it's going to be big. Uh, you should learn how to program. So at 12, he started to program. And at 17, he got his first internship at Google as an engineer. And I think we, we like to complain. We like to talk about the, the unions, the educational unions, the teachers' unions, and how they're not allowing us to really evolve and innovate when it comes to education. But every single class that I took at Stanford is now on YouTube. If you have a mobile device, you can take every single computer science class that the engineers who started Google, who started Yahoo, who started Snapchat, ended up taking. And so there really isn't an excuse by, around education and getting world-class education here in Mexico. The, the, the next thing is, um, I think, going to be something that uh, some will argue with me on. Um, so when I was at Stanford, given that it was the dot-com boom, I tried to start five companies. All five of those companies failed. Not like little failures, but like ca catastrophic failures. For a couple of them, I raised a little bit of capital, and they just failed. Uh, it wasn't until I went to Google that I really learned what it meant to scale a business. It wasn't until I went to Google that I realized, huh, when you're architecting an application, you should think about double byte. Because if you want to build a global platform, you're probably going to want to go to Asia or look at non-romance language characters. So I learned a tremendous amount. And so my, my suggestion, my recommendation to a lot of the a lot of people that I talk to who are, who are fresh grads, who are thinking of graduating, um, it's don't go and try and start your business right out, of, right out of college. Go and spend a little bit of time at a company that ha is actually facing significant problems because you're going to learn a tremendous amount. Now, you know, earlier, and I will disagree with uh, Mr. Perez from, from Ford about going to work at a Ford. I would argue that it probably doesn't make sense to go and work at a Google, at a Facebook, at, at a Twitter, mainly because these companies are so incredibly large that you're going to be pigeonholed into doing one very specific thing for an extended period of time. You know, when, when Gmail launched back in, what was it, 2004, it launched global product that almost overnight had millions of people on it. It launched with 20 engineers, one product manager, and half a marketing resource. Now, about five years ago, I was talking to the product manager that launched that product, and he was telling me that there was one product manager focused on the archive button. And that's basically what happens. Once you get to a certain scale, once you get to a certain size, the overall impact that you're going to have is, is going to be much, much smaller. Now, do you, should you join a startup? Obviously, at a startup, they, they don't have a lot of people. They, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to be doing a lot of things. But the thing with startups is that 95% of them fail, right? 4.999% achieve some level of success, like the Uyala acquisition. And then 0.0001% are the ones that turn into the Googles, the Facebooks, the Slacks of the world, uh, that grow incredibly fast and are multi-billion dollar companies. I think as a company or as an individual, you need to join a rocket ship, a company that's going through exponential growth. So Sheryl Sandberg, which you just saw at the, in the last, um, uh, on the last slide, on this slide, she's a woman right next to Mark Zuckerberg. She's the COO. Uh, during the Bill Clinton administration, she was basically the chief of staff for the Treasury Department. So indirectly, she managed thousands of people. And after Bill Clinton was out of office, she was trying to get into the private sector. And she was offered CEO roles. She was offered COO roles at companies with hundreds, thousands of people. And she just happened to sit um, in, I believe, first class. Uh, next to the CEO of Google at the time. And they kind of met, they kind of started talking. They ha I don't think they knew each other back then. 
And Eric Schmidt said, you know, you really should come look at Google and seriously look at Google. Google is a rocket ship. And this, I think, is incredibly important. I think you want to join fast growth companies that are just starting to become real companies because you're going to learn a tremendous amount. You're going to be given a tremendous amount of access and responsibility, which is ultimately going to help you in the future. What's also really interesting about joining rocket ships is that they start to hire and retain amazing talent. Talent that in the future can be your investors, your co-founders, your partners. So the people that I worked with at, at Google at the time, Cheryl is the COO of Facebook now. Gokul Rajaram, who is my boss, it runs basically all of product and technology at Square. Sundar Pichai and, and Nick Fox are people who are still at Google and, and running Google. And these are some of the things that you get to do at a company that's at 100, 200 people, but on its way to 1,000 or several thousand. Um, so the, the thing that you're going to ask is, well, there aren't a lot of these companies in, in Mexico. Not yet, and we're working on that, right? Like We want to make sure that out of this group, out of the, the, in this building, in the next five to 10 years, we do produce a unicorn. We do produce companies that are worth billions of dollars and have a global impact. But here in Guadalajara, Uyala is a great place to work. Wiseline is obviously a great place to work. Kweski is a great place to work that's run by an amazing entrepreneur who, uh, who actually set up the Uyala operations here in Guadalajara. And so you already have options here in Mexico to work at these companies that are at hundreds of people that are scaling significantly. You're going to meet amazing people. You're going to grow businesses. Out of Uyala, I believe at this point there have been about 15 startups that have been started from employees who came out of Uyala. In total, the companies have probably raised between 750 and a billion dollars because you just get to learn more and see more. The next, the next piece is the ecosystem. Um, one of the things that we need to do here in Mexico is, is build the ecosystem around the technology industry. So one of the things that Silicon Valley does incredibly well is that the entire supply chain of building businesses has been figured out and has been optimized for technology businesses. So the lawyers, they won't actually send you an invoice until after you raise capital. They understand that some of the businesses will never raise capital and will just flame out. But the ones that do are ultimately going to be companies that they may be able to offer services when the company goes public. Same with accountants. Same with people who are actually building offices. You know, right now, the Wiseline uh, office is in the old Kodak Park here in Guadalajara. And when we had just opened, we held an office opening. And the day, the, a day later, one of the security guards asked us, hey, um, we believe some of your employees are drinking at work. Because one of, one of our security guards saw beer in your fridge. And we had to explain to them that, you know what? At our company, we have beer in our fridge 24 seven, and we trust our employees to do what they're going to do and to do the right thing. She was just flabbergasted. Um, we were trying to get our local business permit and the person who came to look at our office didn't give us the business permit because we had beer in our fridge. And again, this is a small example, but it's, it's some, one of the things that's ancillary but relevant to the overall ecosystem. The second thing that I think needs to change in terms of the ecosystem is this whole idea of not telling people what you're working on. There are so many entrepreneurs that I've met here in Mexico that just say, well, I'm working on a project, but I can't tell you what it is. It's stealth. I, 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 you know, you may steal my idea. And that also needs to change. Ideas evolve. When we first started Uyala, we were going to use computer vision to make clickable TV ads. I used to joke that I never wanted to see another Tampax ad on TV because I'm obviously not the target audience. And so we had built Uyala to actually fix that problem. 
But as we started talking to people and seeing what the real business problem was, we realized that most of the companies were still having a difficult time just putting their video online. And so the business and the company evolved based on the inputs that we received from the community and everybody that we were, that we were meeting with. So the next thing, so why did Silicon Valley take off? Uh, Silicon Valley took off because post-World War II, uh, the US was fighting a cold war against the USSR, capitalism against communism. And so it was the survival of the US, the American way of life, that actually made the Silicon Valley grow. So here you have Hewlett and Packard, who started HP. And in the 1950s, their business started to take off because the US government needed the equipment that they were building. Right? The reason that the USSR has had amazing engineers, and you've had people like Sergey Brin, who, whose family came from the USSR, is because they focused on education and building amazing technologies to make sure that their that their way of life survived. One of the earliest, earliest companies that really triggered everything was this company called Shockley. And Shockley, uh, the, the original inventor and then the company, they were the inventors of the, uh, the transistor. From Shockley, you had employees who left and started Fairchild Semiconductor. From Fairchild, you had the group that left, the traitorous eight that left Fairchild and started Intel. And then from Intel, it was like a nuclear bomb that, that went off, and the fallout was the Silicon Valley. Pretty much every single company can trace its heritage all the way back to Shockley. If you look at Google, one of their biggest investors, one of the earliest investors was this guy, John Doerr. John Doerr, if you look him up, he is, he invested in Amazon, he invested in a lot of technology companies that we think about, that we know about today. He worked at Intel. And so this is one of the things that we need to do in Guadalajara. We need to create those first companies that are going to seed the other companies that are going to make this really a, a real hotbed of technology. So another example, uh, Israel. Israel has 7 million people, yet second to the US, it has the most companies listed on the NASDAQ. There are more startups in Israel than anywhere else, per capita, than anywhere else in the world, even more so than in the US. So it's, it's a nation of immigrants, right? People left from, from Europe and populated Israel. And usually immigrants have, have very little, and so they have very little to lose. But one of the main reasons that they've actually been able to become a hotbed of technology and innovation is that they're surrounded by people in countries that would prefer that they not be there. And so as a result, they've invested heavily in technology and innovation. Because it's a small country, they have a, a citizen, a populist-led military. So the military, everybody has to serve in the military a certain period of time. And because the government has invested heavily in technology, in security, in artificial in intelligence, in, com in computer vision, you have a good percentage of the population that actually goes through and is exposed to some of the most innovative technology out there in the market. And after they leave, they take their learnings and go and build companies. And so again, survival. Now, how is this relevant? How is this important, right? I, um, obviously, because of Trump, there's, there's a possibility that our relationships with the US may not be as great if he actually becomes president. Personally, I think uh, if all of the Mexicans who are in the US came back to Mexico, Mexico would be a better place. I think we need more reverse immigration, but we won't discuss politics right now. Uber has completely changed the taxi industry, the transportation industry. It's a company that didn't exist eight years ago, and in most places where they launch, 
the transportation industry has completely changed. Airbnb is now the biggest hotel owner, even though they don't have any, any supply. And I think he, this is the opportunity for Mexico. Every single company from Ford to Barclays to Coppel is about to, is about to go through a transition that they can't do alone. And every single one of these companies runs the risk of dying. You know, it's really interesting for us to be in the Kodak complex because this was, Kodak was a company that controlled the world. They were one of the biggest companies in the world. But because they didn't innovate, they died out. And companies that have been around decades, over 100 years, run the risk of dying out. And so as engineers, as entrepreneurs, I would look at these industries and think about what are some of the problems that need to be solved and go and pursue those problems. Go create solutions to solve those problems because these are trillion dollar industries that are, that are changing and are going to change. So Mexico today produces more engineers than France. I'm sure everybody has seen something similar to this. A lot of the really talented engineers go off to the US, they go to Europe. Uh, this needs to change. We need to create opportunities where the engineers who are here are actually going to continue to produce great technologies here and then export those technologies to the rest of the world. We have the population. I know we can do it. Talents evenly distributed across the world. We have the same people who would be able to start a Snapchat, who would be able to start a Twitter, who would be able to start a Facebook in this room. A lot of people talk about capital as being the, the limiting factor. Now with AWS, it's incredibly easy to start a company and get up and running with very little capital. One of the companies I worked at uh, when I was in college was a company called Elance. And before we, before we switched on the domain and actually started driving product to the business, we had to invest $6 million in infrastructure and in servers. $6 million. So in the late 90s, I would agree with you. You need capital be, to get up and running. Now you can actually get up and running very quickly, very easily. The next, the next piece, um, so this is Patricio Villalobos. Patricio Villalobos uh, was the founder of Medio Tiempo, which was then bought by Grupo Expansión. Uh, in the late 90s, he was, he was working at the Tech Monterrey. He loved soccer, absolutely loved soccer, and was going to go uh, for a year to, um, to study in Germany. And given that at the time there was a bit of delay on soccer scores, he, he built a little application, mobile application, uh, that would just SMS, would text him the results from his favorite soccer teams. When he got back, he noticed that there were a lot of people using this service, and so he turned it into Medio Tiempo. He didn't raise any venture capital, and eventually sold the business for tens of millions of dollars uh, to Time Inc. or Grupo Expansión. He became the CTO of Grupo Expansión, then left, started an accelerator, and is not, now runs Juan Football and a couple of other startups. So for me, I think we need to be more optimistic, right? You know, there's, um, there's, this, there's this saying in this magazine on the last issue they, that, that I, I, you know, pretty much any biography that you read about Steve Jobs, they talk about this idea of stay hungry, stay foolish. And I think it's what we need here is to also stay optimistic. You know, I think our parents, our grandparents, lived dur during a very difficult time in Mexican history, right? There was a tremendous amount of corruption, even more so than there is today. I think with social networks and the flow of information, governments are becoming much more open because they have to. Not because they want to, but because they have to. I think right now with a lot of the trust busting policies, you're going to get a lot more competition. Carlos Slim's overall um, share of, of the market hasn't really diminished since they have increased competition, but the quality of service has improved. And if you look at the revenue they're making for every single customer, it's down significantly. And why is that? Because they're being forced to compete. 
And so this is a, a magical time for Mexico. Right now, it feels like the U.S. post-World War II, when, when the U.S. just took off and became the most dominant country in the world. And so I think as a, as, as a country, as a people, we need to be more optimistic. We need to believe that we can do things. Businesses for a, a really long time were family owned and it's very easy to understand why parents would say, why am I gonna work harder? That role is going to go to my cousin, to the owner's cousin, to the owner's son, to the owner's, but that's changing as these companies are also being forced to compete on the global stage. So I think all of these things really paint a positive picture, but ultimately it's going to require that we change the way that we think about the opportunities and the future of this country and, the, uh, and our very own future. So uh, just uh, one final thing uh, before we open it up to, to any questions, if you have some. Um, we're, uh, we're, running, we're running this event uh, we've partnered with a company called Code Fights, and we're sponsoring this event uh, where we're trying to find the best engineers who are here. We already have a couple hundred people who have signed up. So if you haven't signed up, you should sign up, check it out. Uh, let's go see who, uh, who can win. We're going to have the finales at the end of, uh, uh, at the, the end of campus party uh, to figure out who's the best engineer in these four walls. So with that, I'll leave you with my, uh, my email address. Uh, Bismarck at gmail.com also gets to me. If you have any questions, if you're a, an entrepreneur who's, who's starting a business, if you have questions, please feel free to email me. Weekends are a little bit better for me to respond than weekdays, just because of the regular work week. But please let me know how I can help. Thank you. Any questions? There should be a cube. Who has a question? All right, I think I used this once. You have a question? Anybody have a question? All right. Oh, well. I wasn't very good at sports. Right there on the red shirt. Right here. Right there. I think you have to speak into the top of the box. There we go. Ah, there we go. All right. Um, you were saying that there would be a lot of growth in, question, in regards to technology and everything, robots making the things. What, what is your opinion about increasing? Uh, this, this could lead to increasing the difference between the poor and the, and the rich. Uh, what is your opinion about that if technology does that is, is something that is good or, or not? No, that's a really good question. Um, so I think, I think the question is really about access to opportunity. La, la pregunta es de que con la tecnología puede ser que la distancia de la gente que tiene dinero y la gente que no tiene dinero se va a hacer más grande. Y, y yo pienso que ahorita en este punto estamos en un punto apropiado que no es tanto la distancia de los que tienen dinero y los que no tienen dinero, o la los que tienen tecnología o los que no tienen tecnología, es los que se pueden mejorar y los que no se pueden mejorar. Y la realidad es que con el Internet, la mayoría de las personas tienen la el acceso para poder mejorarse en este punto. Pero la, ri la, riqueza, la riqueza se va a concentrar de nuevo. Y ahorita es muy importante, si tienen hermanos, si tienen hijos, que le pongan ganas, porque sí se va a poner muy interesante en 30, 40 años que Mark Zuckerberg ya es el quinto persona más rica del mundo, porque pudo crear una aplicación y hizo tecnología que sacó al mercado y en menos de, menos de 10 años pasó eso. Y eso va a pasar en muchas de estas industrias, entonces se va a concentrar la riqueza de nuevo, como en los tipos 1800, y es muy importante que nos pongamos las, las pilas ahorita y le trabajemos. No va a ser fácil, va, va a necesitar que le estudiemos, pero sí va a haber muchas oportunidades para nosotros. ¿Se las pasa? Bueno, mi pregunta también es en español. Este, estaba leyendo en, el, en la guía de Campusero de que se van a perder aproximadamente 7 millones de empleos en, la, en un futuro. 
pero se van a crear dos millones. O sea, esas cinco millones de personas que se van a quedar sin empleo, ¿en dónde quedan a pesar de que están estudiadas? O sea, yo me explico, ¿no? Tienen una educación, eh, fueron a la escuela, pero ya no van a ser necesarias cuando toda la tecnología pueda ser accesible, por así decirlo. No, es algo, algo difícil. Uh, yo tuve una reunión así social con dos, dos ingenieros que tenían como 58, 60 años, uh, hace como 7 años. Hace 7 años Google estaba contratando como loco, no, como ya como 10 años, hace 10 años. Google estaba contratando como loco, Facebook estaba contratando como loco. Y los ingenieros me estaban diciendo que era tan difícil encontrar trabajo. Un ingeniero. Decían, no, aquí la, la, el tiempo de, de oro del de, de Silicon Valley, del Valle del Silicio, fue en los ochentas. Cuando te podías enojar con tu jefe y a las tres horas ya tenías otro trabajo y te, hasta te daban un BM. Y eso ha, ha estado pasando por mucho tiempo y la realidad es que si quieres tener ciertos sueldos, quieres seguir estando en ciertas industrias, te tienes que actualizar cada 5 o 10 años y no te puedes quedar estancado. Ahora, el problema es de que mucha de la mano de obra se va a automatizar y ya estamos a un punto donde en las primeras, en las primeras tres etapas de, las, uh, así de los cambios industriales siempre crearon más trabajos. Pienso que ahora con la automatización ya va a haber menos trabajos de mano de obra. Y eso va a ser, va a ser un problema. Ahorita la maquila está dan, le está dando mucho dinero a México. Pero a rato, las, em, las empresas automotrices van a poder tener todas sus fábricas 100% automatizadas, donde vas a poder ordenar tu coche en la mañana y te llega al color que lo quieres, te, con los, los asientos que los quieres en la tarde. Y eso va, lo van a estar haciendo ahí muy cercas. Entonces, es un, es, va a ser un problema muy grande. Y, y yo pienso que todos los pueblos, todas las sociedades van a tener que mantener cierta población que no van a estar educada. Uh, uh, well, one question. Um, these type of events uh, are really for like, uh, let's just say 5% of the population. Those who are already educated and involved in this uh, startup environment, but um, um, what can we do about, for example, existing companies that have traditional uh, processes and, and ways of operation, and also about uh, young kids, for example, what efforts could we do in uh, uh, five-year-olds, ten-year-old kids to grow an innovation culture uh, with them and also with the already existing market to create a work environment suitable for this new uh, movement. Yeah, so the question, la, la pregunta era de que, que podemos, ahorita toda la gente que está aquí es como el 5% de, de la población de México. Los que ya están educados, los que ya, los que ya saben un poco de tecnología y para dónde van las industrias. Y la pregunta es, ¿qué podemos hacer para el resto de la población? Yo pienso que lo más importante es que tenemos que crear ejemplos para que haya un mexicano, Marco Zuckerberg, que, que quieran hacer en vez de chicharito, ¿no? Y pienso que eso, esa es una de las cosas que tenemos que hacer. Después, obviamente, tenemos que cambiar el sistema académico, pero eso va a tomar un poco más tiempo. Uh, yo pienso que la, la, la cosa que se puede hacer tienen que empezar en la casa. Tienen la, ustedes que van a ser padres tienen que poner el empeño en que la educación importa, porque la realidad es que es mucho más seguro que el Marco Zuckerberg va a salir de aquí, pero porque uno no necesita tanto capital para poder llegar a un nivel, una persona de un rancho va a poder decir, no, yo puedo hacer esa aplicación. Pero necesitamos ese ejemplo que sí se puede y sí se puede con tecnología. Gracias. Eh, pues yo personalmente quisiera saber, bueno, antes que nada me llamo Jesús del Campo y le he estado mandando tweets por, por ahí estos días, pero yo quisiera saber cuál es su papel, cuál es el papel de Bismarck aquí en Guadalajara, por qué como, 
¿Cómo decirlo? Pues personalmente es un ejemplo para mí usted que no he encontrado en la parte del sureste del país, que yo, nosotros venimos de Mérida y la realidad es que así como personas que quieren impulsar las cosas así bien gacho y que tengan como que la cola, el expertise, la calle como decimos coloquialmente, de ya haberlo hecho y de poder hablar con esa autoridad de pues, yo ya viví algo, ya lo hice, y te puedo dar un consejo que no es de inversionista de bienes raíces, sino de inversionista de este sector. Yo no lo he encontrado en el sureste. Y únicamente se, pues están aquí, es la realidad. Pero me gustaría saber cómo siente Bismarck que, que es su papel aquí en Guadalajara para inspirar a como nos ha inspirado a nosotros a venir aquí y pues seguir buenos ejemplos como el suyo. Más que nada eso. Yo, yo tuve la buena suerte de que caí ahí en el Silicon Valley. Y fue pura chiripada porque... Yo iba a ir a West Point, porque como sí, mis padres así no tenían mucho dinero, me iba a ir a West Point y la universidad iba a ser gratis, pero de casualidad entré a, a Stanford y eso me cambió a mí la vida. Uh, mira, yo los, cinco, los primeros cinco años, yo era más mexicano que el mexicano que encuentras en cualquier esquina, de rancho, 100%. Me acuerdo que cuando llegábamos de Estados Unidos y volábamos a Guadalajara, veía las mansiones ahí en, en donde está el Palomar y Bugambilias y veía y dije, ¿dónde está esto? Porque eso yo nomás pensaba que existía en Estados Unidos. Entonces, más que nada, estoy aquí porque me siento mexicano y pienso que tengo la obligación de ayudar y pienso que como hay muy pocos latinos en el Valle de Silicio, alguien lo tiene que hacer. Y al rato va a haber más y nos, nos los vamos a jalar. Uh, pero también, yo soy el CEO de una empresa que tiene inversionistas y nosotros vemos que hay mucho talento aquí y que mucho de este talento no le han dado la oportunidad de resolver problem, problemas fuertes. Entonces, los, me, los mejores se quieren ir a Estados Unidos porque piensan que van a tener retos más importantes y más grandes. Entonces, empezando las empresas que he empezado aquí, la meta es, tenemos que traer empresas que se hacen producto aquí a México, porque de ahí salen los, los buenos emprendedores que no nomás tienen las ganas, pero ya la experiencia de ver algo crecer. Ahorita México está como la India estaba en 2003. La, en el 2003, IIT, que es la universidad más, la, el grupo de universidades más grandes de, de la India, el 70% de los que ejercían en IIT se, venía, se iban a Europa o a Estados Unidos. Esos ingenieros fueron de los primeros empleados en Cisco, en Sun, en, en Google, o fundaron empresas y ahora ya son inversionistas. No fue hasta el 2005, 2006 que Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft empezaron a abrir desarrollo de producto, no nomás así como maquila, en, en la India. Y ahora, ahorita si ves las 14 empresas en la India que tienen una evaluación arriba de un billón de dólares, todos esos emprendedores salieron de esas empresas. Y ahora, menos del 30% de los que ejercen la IT se salen de la India. Entonces, necesitamos que esa fuga de talento se quede aquí, pero se tienen que quedar aquí para resolver retos interesantes y diferentes. Acá, acá Bismarck. Hola, eh, mi pregunta es, como comentaste que allá en Estados Unidos se reconoce el fracaso, muchas empresas tienen, mu eh, muchos emprendedores empiezan muchas startups que fracasan y después le pegan, tu caso inicialmente, ¿qué nos dirías a nosotros los emprendedores de aquí que estamos luchando con ese fracaso de empresa y micro fracasos en nuestro emprendimiento eh, que tenemos actualmente? Y dos, eh, ¿Cómo manejar la mentalidad de los eh, del Venture Capital Tapatío o el Angel Capital aquí Tapatío que buscan lana y que co tú como emprendedor les des eh, como que estás vendiendo antes de solucionar un problema o generar atracción de usuarios? Que es como la mentalidad de los pocos fondos que tenemos aquí en la ciudad. Pues la primera pregunta así de que el, cómo podemos cambiar, cómo la gente ve el fracaso. La gente habla de que en el South Campbell la 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 todos pueden fracasar y como que es un honor que fracasaste y esto y esto otro. No, es terrible fracasar. Te traumas. 
Es, no, es cierto. No tienes dinero, tienes empleados que vas a tener que correr. Es, es terrible. Entonces, pienso que eso es un mito de, del Silicon Valley. La cosa que, que sí pasa es de que porque fracasas no indica que no vas a poder tra tratar de hacerlo de nuevo. Porque muchos de los inversionistas sí ven que uno aprende mucho de los fracasos. Ahora, en el Valle de Silicio, en Silicon Valley, fracasas dos veces y ya va a ser muy difícil. Seguidas, va a ser muy difícil de que puedas levantar capital. Um, ahora, el capital de alto riesgo, en el 2011, 2012, la, la, las pensiones en, eh, pudieron invertir en, en fondos de alto riesgo, así en Venture Capital. Entonces, ha subido 10 veces, 20 veces el número de fondos que existen en México. Hay muy pocos aquí, la mayoría están en el DF, pero sí hay mucho capital, hay mucho capital semilla en México. Llegas a un punto cuando ya estás creciendo, te vas a tener que ir a Estados Unidos a levantar el, el capital de crecimiento. Pero así estaba Israel. Israel empezaban las empresas ahí, pero cuando querían crecer, se tenían que ir a Estados Unidos para levantar el capital. A ver, una pregunta más. A ver, ahí de Uyala. Hola, hola Bismarck, gracias por la presentación. Y a mí me gustaría que nos dijeras cómo, o sea, si nos expones que hay un problema de imagen que desde luego nosotros tenemos de nosotros mismos, los mexicanos, ¿cuál sería la manera que podríamos hacer, o sea, de manera activa, luchar contra esa imagen negativa que tenemos de nosotros mismos? La, la mejor manera no es de hablar, pero en acciones. Y eso es lo que tenemos que hacer. Los, los mismos empresarios tienen que empezar a, a crear un mejor perfil de, de México, tienen que invertir en, su, en la misma gente y si uno invierte en la gente, cambia todo esto muy rápido. Mucha, ahorita Nueva York es una de las ciudades más seguras del mundo. Hace 20 años no era así, era una de las peores ciudades del mundo y en 20 años cambió completamente. Y pienso que nosotros en 5 a 10 años podemos cambiar el perfil de México increíblemente. Pero lo tenemos que hacer en los, cinco, en los siguientes 5 o 10 años o se va a poner dura la cosa. Muchas gracias. Gracias.